So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the latest installment of the Aperio Teaching and Learning Meeting. Today is Wednesday, May 1st. My name is Matt Burgess. I'm from the University of Virginia. I'll be facilitating our call today. Uh, looking forward to having a little Jira Palooza and discussing a few Jiras related to teaching and learning. So if you guys have any of those that you would like to discuss, uh, feel free to throw those in the etherpad. I've pasted the link to the etherpad in the chat, and I'll do that again for those of you who might have joined recently. Or you can just bring them up as we go along by pasting them in the chat right here in our meeting room. Before we dive in here, we always take a few minutes to go through some announcements and see what's going on in the community. Uh, I know Wilma is on the call with us this morning and is the community coordinator. She's usually got a few things that are going on. So, Wilma, do you want to? take us through any announcements that you have before we dive in? Sure. Um, the main announcement that I had is just a reminder about Open Aperio. The early bird deadline is coming up at the end of this week. It's um, through May uh, 3rd, and today's the 1st of May, if you can believe it. <laughs> it seems like it got here in no time at all. Um, but uh, if you are uh, interested in going, I, I urge you to go ahead and register this week. Um, this Friday, I believe, is also the deadline for the hotel room. So um, if you want to get in on the room block pricing, um, be sure to make those reservations before Friday. That's great. Thank you, Wilma. I know that many of us who are on the call are often there every year. I look forward to seeing you all every year. I know Tiffany and I will be there. I know Stephen and Adam and Charles are usually there. Um, so if you haven't been before, if you've been for many years, I hope you guys are going to be joining us again uh, because it's always a great time and a good time to brainstorm and collaborate among the community. I see in the chat that Adam is looking forward to it. Charles will be registering this afternoon. That's great. I still need to make my hotel reservation. So thank you for that reminder, Wilma. That's something that I need to put on my to-do list for today. So that's great. Yep, and I put a li link to the conference website in the Etherpad in case you guys need the link. Um, I can paste it again here in the chat just in case you guys uh, need a quick link to get there. Oh, and one other um, just kind of an FYI, um, as most of you know, we released um, Sakai 19 a few weeks back, and we're hoping to get um, release candidate uh, one out for the 19.1 release in the next week or two. The goal right now is to have a 19.1 um, general availability uh, right before the conference. So we're, we're shooting for the end of, of the month to get that out. So hopefully we'll stay on track with that and have 19.1 um, available soon. That's great. Thank you, Wilma. Charles has a question in the chat, Wilma, about any ideas regarding the release for 19.2. Um, I don't have any dates on that, but I would estimate at least a couple months. So um, if we get 19.1 out, you know, right before the conference, I would say maybe around sometime in August, possibly, for a 19.2 but that's really just kind of a guess. Um, we'd have to get a better sense of it uh, once we get 19.1 out and see, you know, um, what, what needs to be done for the next iteration. Sure, that makes sense. Thanks, Wilma. Any other announcements from anybody before we dive in here? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and paste the first JIRA from our list in the Etherpad in the chat. This is SAC uh, 41452. Some of you may have seen some traffic about this issue um, going on in the various lists relatively recently. Uh, this is a JIRA to warn instructors when they are working with group submission assignments, <clears throat> excuse me, and also group locking. Um, so, of course, some of you may have experienced this issue, and we've certainly experienced it here at UVA, uh, where we have occasions where instructors have created group submissions and then 
uh, either have edited those groups or have learned that they can't edit those groups or shouldn't edit those groups once the assignments are released. Um, and so this is a JIRA that adds uh, some text when creating that assignment uh, to include a warning about that. So I don't know if you all have experienced this at your institutions or if you have thoughts about this, um, but we'll take a second so that anybody who has thoughts or comments can either chime in on the mic or in the chat. I see in the chat that Heather's mentioned that this is an ongoing issue for some of their instructors. Uh, this is definitely an ongoing issue for instructors at UVA as well. I mean, maybe one of the crappiest technical issues, for lack of a better word, that we're experiencing right now. And Charles adds in the chat that this is something that they're experiencing as well. So Tiffany's mentioned in the chat here that what may be really needed is a fix to the underlying problem. You know, the empty or dummy submissions that are generated when there are changes to groups uh, after a group assignment is assigned to particular groups. Um, and I think that's definitely true. Um, but I think we may need to apply some sort of band-aid type fix in the meantime before that can be enabled. And maybe we need some text uh, for that in the meantime. Any other thoughts or comments about SAC 41452 before we move on here? Yeah, Tiffany notes in the chat that a warning would be good. Um, and the problem here is that the Band-Aid fix is locking the groups, um, which is not a Band-Aid from the start. And yeah, I think we've had some conversation in the various lists and on some of these calls about um, locking groups and you know some of the issues associated with locking groups, especially in testing quizzes. And Adam notes in the chat that maybe a warning should be put up sooner rather than later to at least inform the instructor of potential future issues and that we can address the underlying fix after that. Um, I think that's a good idea as well, Adam. Um, I think that's something that we should probably comment in this year if we haven't done so already. Um, we probably need to go ahead and add that in. So I would encourage folks, if they haven't done so already, to vote this issue up uh, on the JIRA, to go to this particular JIRA and vote for it, and also to leave some comments um, indicating that it's the preference of this group that we might want to go ahead and put this warning in sooner rather than later. Great, Adam. Thank you for doing that. Adam notes uh, in the comments that he'll go ahead and put that comment in. And Charles also adds in the chat that a warning would be useful now um, until such time as a better solution is implemented. So it seems like at least among all of us, and we represent a quorum, that's going to be uh, the ruling of this quorum. So I think that sounds good. All right, so let it be written, so let it be done. So let's move on to our next issue here, and I'll put a link to this issue in the chat. This is SAC 41607, um, which is an issue related to supposedly anonymous comments and lessons, uh, which are actually not anonymous. Uh, and so if you look at the screenshots uh, that Derek placed in the JIRA here, uh, it looks like, according to these screenshots, these anonymous comments are not actually anonymous here. And Wilma, I see that there's a comment from you um, that the TNL group looked at this JIRA on the 17th, and unfortunately the UVA folks weren't able to be here because we had another meeting. So do you want to kind of take us through some of that or, or give us just some of your recollections about the discussion that you all had a couple weeks ago? 
Okay, let me um, refresh my memory here. Hang on one second. Um, that was the non-anonymous. Okay, so what we had talked about last time was that this, um, they're basically proposing a change to make it more like um, the anonymous grading in assignments um, because initially there was a bug where the the names were showing up and um, and I believe they fixed it so that students no longer see the name but Bernardo was asking if they needed to hide the name from instructors as well because currently the instructor sees um, anonymous and then the name of the user in parentheses um, and that's the way it works right now but what he was um, suggesting was that maybe it needed to be completely anonymous if people didn't want to see the names at all, regardless of whether or not it's an instructor. And so TNL had talked about it last time and we couldn't really agree. It was sort of a split um, sense that, you know, sometimes you might want to see the name um, so that you know, you know, who's posting, but then other times if you're doing it for grades and you want to grade anonymously, you might not want to see the names. So, um, so we said that, you know, the, kind of the best of both worlds would be if, um, if there could be a third option where you can choose to hide the names from the instructor, but by default it shows up. The default behavior being the current behavior. And so my recommendation was that, that they not change it on people without introducing that third option because I think it would cause confusion for folks that are used to the way it works now. I want to suggest at that point too that, that um, there be a designation of the two a distinction so that if the student is told something is anonymous, it truly is anonymous. Un but labeling the other option to the student is saying only the teacher will see this or something like that. Um, because if the student is told that something is anonymous, it needs to be anonymous. Yeah, that's a good point. I wonder what the usage is for this particular feature right now. You know, I know there are a lot of little features and lessons that have been worked in over time. And I just wonder, you know, how some of those features are being used. Do any of you all have a sense of how a feature like this is being used at your institutions right now? Do you know of instructors that are using this off the top of your head? It might be good to just get a kind of general sense of how widespread some of these features are at this time. I do not really have a good sense of that, to be honest, but I did want to um, kind of um, chime in on what Terry just said about if if something is labeled as anonymous, the, the level of anonymity should be indicated, whether it's anonymous just to other students or anonymous to students and the instructor. In any case where there are anonymous things, actually. I think that makes sense to me too, Charles, especially in a case like this one where at least currently we don't see the same level of true anonymity that the students might expect with something called anonymous comments or something like that. And so we have some comments here in the chat um, from Tiffany noting that we removed that supposedly completely anonymous option in forums because you can de-anonymize it if you link it to a gradebook item. Um, and then she follows up here uh, that we probably shouldn't have anything that claims it is fully anonymous to the instructor because as soon as gradebook or statistics become involved, you can often de-anonymize. And that is true. Um, and that's something that we need to think about as well when we're thinking about you know, things that are, that are truly anonymous or things that aren't. My guess is that when this feature was developed in lessons, it was developed with the idea that the comments would be anonymous to the respective students. They would be allowed to comment or potentially ask questions in a way that was anonymous to their fellow students, but wasn't necessarily anonymous to the instructor. Obviously, since we didn't develop the feature, I can't speak to that with any level of confidence, but that's my guess about how this feature was initially developed. I suspect that's probably correct, Matt. The the thing that just occurred and popped into my head is, I I wonder do 
do any of us know what do students expect if they see something labeled anonymous? Do they expect that the instructor would be able to identify them um, or not? And I have no idea what the answer to that is. That's also a really good question, Charles. I think, and some of you may have experienced this as well, that occasionally students will post things when they believe they are posting anonymously in the anonymous feedback contrib tool, for example, which we use here at UVA, um, that indicates that they believe that they are posting completely anonymously because they are posting things that are inappropriate. And we obviously don't see that with huge frequency, but we do see it occasionally. And so that suggests to me that at least some students believe that when they see that word anonymous, when they see that option, you know, they believe that their identity is going to be complete. Uh, and I agree with Dave, and I think this is something that Charles was getting at as well, that, you know, we would have to form students or, you know, reach out to students in some way, form some kinds of focus groups to determine more about exactly what students think about when they see that word. And I see a comment from Terry here that historically, you know, anonymous in Samago uh, is completely anonymous for the integrity of confidential polling or surveys. Yes, Terry, I think that's true. Although I do know that, you know, with anonymous grading, you can at least match up, you know, which students have submitted and received a grade and which students haven't. Tiffany notes in the chat that she prefers, you know, providing a message to students like the following, you know, your post will be anonymous, but your identity will be revealed to those with appropriate permissions. But please refrain from including any identifying information in your post. And while that might be just a little wordy, I do think that's the general idea uh, that we probably want to think about uh, for messages like this one. I think that can be really helpful. I also think when we're thinking about issues like this one in lessons, and Wilma might be able to speak to this to some extent, we should also think about the fact that we are certainly hoping for lessons to undergo a fairly significant uh, rewrite in the not too distant future. And so you know, while these things might be things that we want to log, you know, we may not necessarily want to make a bunch of significant changes for features like these and then immediately dive into lessons 2.0 where they might be changed again. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, the the current behavior is, I think, what most people are accustomed to with it showing up for the instructor, the, the name of the anonymous person. Um, I, at, at this point, because we're sort of on the cusp of a rewrite, I would probably save the effort <laughs> in, in designing a lot of additional options and just maybe if we can include a, a message um, to the student like uh, the one Tiffany suggested something along those lines that might be an easy um, way to handle it in the interim and then just sort of keep some of these options in mind as part of the rewrite. I think that sounds good to me too Wilma. Anybody else have any thoughts about this one? Tiffany notes in the chat that she'd have to look back at the warding that we ultimately displayed to students in forums here at UVA, um, but that was you know, the gist of the general message that she had proposed. And Charles notes in the chat that we probably want to keep this as is with maybe a warning. Um, getting back to what Wilma was saying about refraining from yanking the current behavior out from under instructors. Um, some instructors may want to include comments in their evaluation of an exercise involving student pages, and I think that seems to be, to be the natural case where these could be used as well. I will add another comment to that JIRA with them. Our proposed warning message. That sounds great. Thank you, Wilma. All right, I'm going to put the next link in our chat. This is SAC 41722. There's been a fairly significant amount of traffic about this JIRA on the list in recent weeks. Um, this is a feature request to 
add the ability to hide uh, completed assignments after grades or feedback are released. Um, and I know a number of people have been exchanging emails about this issue, um, including Laura Geckler and Sean Platt and Laura Sierra. Uh, Tiffany, I think you were um, adding some comments about this one as well. Um, anybody have uh, thoughts or comments about this one? This was something that one of our instructors had requested at UVA uh, that I worked with her on. And it looked like in um, in her site, the use case was that she was using assignments for like midterm papers and um, final exams and stuff. And so as a result, she wanted to hide the assignment instructions after the students had submitted, but just allow them access to their grades and feedback. Basically, she wanted a feedback system similar to tests and quizzes uh, in assignments because she preferred to accept the, the submissions in assignments. So I think the, the question here, Heather's commenting that she thinks assignments should be available as study aids for students. Um, I, I think that the issue here is how they're using the tool, um, how the instructor is using the tool, that they may want to use it uh, to accept submissions for more exam-like materials um, because there are things in assignments that tools like tests and quizzes don't have, such as you know, peer review and you know, some of those other um, feedback options that if you want to do an iterative assignment, the resubmission option assignments is better for that than something like tests and quizzes where you don't have access to your previous submission when you're uh, resubmitting. In this case, Tiffany, did the instructor give you any additional context about why she preferred assignments as the tests and quizzes? Was she wanting to work with one of those options or? No. She didn't. She just had the assignment. You know, I think this was more a case of she had the assignments and now she wanted to hide them but couldn't. <laughs> um. And Terry notes in the chat that the final may be a set of essay questions. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think the thing that we want to think about, and I know that this has been talked about in some of the email traffic about this JIRA and also relates to the comment that Heather has made in the chat about you know, assignments serving as study aids for students and allowing them to review, is that we don't necessarily want to continue to make adjustments to all of the assessment tools in Sakai such that they all become identical to one another. Um, that if instructors want to use a particular feature set that is more in line with tests and quizzes rather than assignments, then you know we may want to consider having a more in-depth conversation with them about why they aren't using tests and quizzes and you know, what their preferences might be and then exploring those issues further rather than trying to adapt assignments to behave more like the other assessment tool until we make so many adaptations that we merge them all together uh, into one giant blob. I see that Adam is noting that assignments has the ability to do turn it in um, and that's a good point, Adam. Uh, that's not a service that we currently use here at UVA, and so that's often something that we forget about here. Um, but that's a good point that if you want to use a service like that, uh, then assignments is probably going to be your best bet there. And I think this also probably relates to Dave's comment that feedback as a workflow is, is generally disjointed in Sakai and maybe something that we want to continue to think about as we think about you know, more changes to the general look and feel and flow of the system in Sakai 20 and forward. Um, the feedback is something that we definitely want to think about. You know, I think that in general, the way that the assignments tool looks and works uh, for both instructors and students is probably one of our weakest points. Um, and so this might be, you know, another opportunity to consider that here. Adam asked in the chat about whether there should be a, a feedback synoptic tool. Tell me a little bit more about what you mean by that, Adam. What do you yeah, mean? Um, Adam.
And Terry also notes in the chat that the new centralized grading service might include some centralized feedback options. And that's a good thing to think about as well, Terry, that you know the community is already aware of some of these underlying issues and is working on some technical solutions that could make things a little bit more uniform across tools. And that's a really good point. Um, this is Dave Eveland, um, but I really appreciate Adam's idea along with Terry's um, because I think if there was a way to surface that feedback to some other place that's, uh, that disenfranchises it from those assignment instructions um, where students could see all that feedback. So um, it's the idea that, you know, if I want to find out how I'm doing, I can see all the information in one place and that accomplishes the goal of disassociating that those assignments instructions. Um, I think there could be some some good levity there. Yeah, Dave, absolutely. I agree. Is anybody on the call currently using bullhorns? Is bullhorns available in any of your instances right now? That's not something that we have currently at UVA. But I'm wondering if that's a good fit for feedback like that. But, you know, when we poll our students, that's regularly their most requested feature is being able to, you know, have more notifications about when stuff is due, when feedback and grades are released to them and those sorts of things. And I think that's the kind of thing where a student would love to see an alert there, oh, you've got grades and feedback for this assignment. And then by clicking that alert, they would be directed directly to that feedback. And I see Charles noting in the chat that they have not uh, enabled bullhorns yet at ISU, but that they get that feedback as well. And also a note from our accessibility guru that there are some accessibility issues um, which we should definitely work through so that we can make features like this available for everybody. And Dave asked in the chat about the possibility of a feedback tool in the home site uh, that pulls synoptic feedback from all currently pulled courses. Yeah, I think that's the kind of thing that we want to think about, Dave. I think that, you know, as we start to think about, you know, things that really need uh, an update in look and feel and performance for Sakai 20 and forward, you know, assignments in my mind is certainly one. More notifications generally is certainly one. And I think a, a redesign of that home site to, you know, perform much more like the dashboard feature uh, that we all hoped uh, would be available in Sakai by this time. Uh, could be a really great addition. I think that if our students at UVA are any indication, people hit that home site and immediately navigate elsewhere uh, because that site doesn't provide them with a lot of useful information. And so it's essentially, you know, an empty landing spot because you're immediately jumping off to go somewhere else. And so if we could rework that site, that landing point to make it more meaningful for students and also for instructors, I think that would be a good thing. And Adam notes in the chat that uh, we should preserve some of these ideas and discussion um, in a feature request JIRA or a farm project. That sounds like you're volunteering to submit that JIRA or that farm project, Adam, or at least take down those notes. No, too late. Too late. You didn't call not it fast enough. <laughs> But I definitely agree, uh, these are the kinds of things um, that we probably want to think about. And I also agree with Adam's comment in the chat that we are moving a little further away from the topic of this particular JIRA, um, which is about hiding assignments when grades are released. Um, anybody else have any thoughts or comments about the specific topic of this particular JIRA before we move on? Okay, then I will paste uh, the next JIRA here in the chat. Oh, and I see a wait, wait from Adam in the chat before we move on. So some discussion about um, date-based releases uh, versus uh, the release of grades. 
Uh, so Adam, I assume what you mean there is about when the assignments would be hidden. Is that what you mean there? Whether they should be hidden when you reach a particular date or when those grades have been released? Sure. Okay. Anybody have thoughts about yeah. that? How this feature might work. Sorry, I decided that I should join audio instead of being like Teller in Penn & Teller. Um, so earlier in the chat when the JIRA first came up, I said that uh, I wasn't subject or party to the earlier discussions, but in looking at the JIRA, the mock-ups that were provided have a checkbox for hiding assignment instructions and submission content to the students after releasing the grade. But test and quizzes works on a retract date basis. So should the instructor create a date and then would that require a service in order to go about retracting it uh, or should it hinge on the release of the grade? Adam, I think that's a good question. If something tells me we may end up having people that want an option to do either or. <laughs> um, I'm interested to hear what other people have to say. I think that's right, Dave. I see Heather's comment in the chat that as an instructor, uh, she thinks that she would like to be able to set a date to hide things. That was also my first instinct as I was thinking about this as Adam was describing it, that it, it might be simpler um, or a little more straightforward to me to simply set a date and say, at this point, I don't want the students to be able to see this assignment in the assignments tool. Um, but I can certainly also understand the use case for automatically removing that assignment from the list once the grades were released and made available to the students. So I, I can certainly see Dave's point that we might have requests for both ends. Yeah, and I would also uh, also like the idea that you may end up having four potential options here. One that retains the behavior as it stands pr presently. Um, one that provides a mechanism for a date specification one that provides a, a option to hide once it's actually released, um, uh, you know, uh, but, you know, and, 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 and some of that may actually, you know, sort of uh, get organized in such a way that you, people may not want to choose dates for everything. They might want to just leave it as is. Some people may want to say, I want a date for this one, but then on this one, I want to release, uh, I want to close when uh, the, 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 the grade is released. Um, uh, so it can get pretty complicated there. Um. That's right, Dave. And I think that's also something that we should think about to circle all the way back to some of the things that we were saying at the beginning of our discussion of this particular era. That you know, one of the things that we do hear from time to time from instructors, and I think we have noticed in the UI ourselves, is that in many tools, especially tools like assignments. The number of options listed there on the options page for the various assignments and other options can be almost overwhelming. You know, that we have accommodated so many different possibilities because we come from such a diverse perspective of you know, educational use cases, all of us across our institutions, that there are just a huge number of options available. And while those options are attractive to some instructors, you know, there are many cases where the majority of instructors want to skip the majority of those options. And that is something that I think we want to think about as we continue to add on features um, that sometimes, you know, adding a feature isn't necessarily the solution to every issue um, that I think we can overwhelm ourselves and our users sometimes with all those options. And Tiffany notes in the chat that this is somewhere a single checkbox could be helpful, you know, something like keep assignment visible. Uh, after submission, and then you know, if you toggled yes or selected yes, then you would see those additional options there. Or no, in this case. That's right. That's right. And Laura, see your comments in the chat that she likes that solution. <laughs> yes, that <maybe. laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, we would need to add a maybe option as well, Dave, to just make sure that we accommodate everybody. I mean, I think in a, a lot of places in the UI where we have a bunch of options, some of those options should really be hidden on the surface until you select something and then they become visible. Uh, and that's, that's definitely true in uh, 
tests and quizzes where we see all these feedback options. It should really just be, do you want to release feedback? Yes, no, no by default, and then you select yes, and then you get all these possible mm -hmm. feedback mm -hmm. uh, things. Mm -hmm. I think that sounds good. Um, any objections to Tiffany entering that you know, as a possible option as a comment in this JIRA? All right, we have multiple go for it. So I think that sounds good. If you could enter that as a comment for this year, I think that sounds like a great idea. So the couple of things I just said that similar to Sam ago, we might want these three options. That's then. right. And then also a comment about how we might want to do that from a high level perspective right. in the UI so that we don't surface all of those options right, right away. All right, I will go ahead and paste the link to the next JIRA here in the chat. This is SAC 41602, um, a JIRA about Dropbox uh, showing folders that belong to users that have been removed or made inactive in the site after they have been removed or made inactive. Tiffany, I think you created this JIRA, so do you mm -hmm. want to walk people through the basic use case here? Sure. Um, this was something that uh, some instructors at UVA encountered, or site administrators, I guess. This was a project site, um, where they have students uh, submitting some materials for uh, sort of progress reports over time. And so they add all the students who are enrolled in their department uh, to this site. And we've got thousands. This is like thousands of students in the site. And um, the students don't need to be active all the time. So they'll periodically deactivate them or remove them from the site uh, as they move through their four years of, of classes. Uh, and this makes Dropbox get enormous, you know, like 4,000 students long uh, of folders. It takes forever to load, and it's very slow uh, for performance. And, and uh, so what these instructors wanted to do was to be able to uh, not see the folders belonging to students who were not currently active in the site or who had been removed. Uh, and unfortunately, because the folders uh, hang out after a student has been removed from the site, assuming there is at least one item in that folder, doesn't matter who has uploaded it, uh, if the student or an instructor uploaded it, uh, the folder remains. And you actually have to delete all of the files in the folder and manually delete the folder to get rid of it. Uh, they wanted to leave it so that if the student was brought back into the site or reactivated, uh, their materials would show up again, similar to how assignments and other tools like that work. Uh, so the proposal here is to have some kind of checkbox so that if you have an enormous number of students um, or you know participants in your site, you can hide uh, the folders belonging to those who've been removed, uh, and then the folders will, you know, of course, come back if they are reactivated. Uh, because there were some objections when I proposed um, in the uh, Slack chat, the Sakai Slack chat. Um, to have those folders disappear. And there's another JIRA that is linked to, uh, to that one, I think, where it was proposed to have folders disappear when people were removed from the site. Uh, the concern was that if an instructor uploads materials to a Dropbox folder, uh, and they may want to retrieve those later, even after the uh, user has left the site, they can't do that uh, without re-adding that user. So Adam comments in the chat that like grading by group, uh, this might be able to be solved by having a filter for subfolder selection and then defaulting that filter to current members. Um, the filters could also potentially have other utilities, uh, for example, downloading by a group. Um, but, and as Adam notes in his next comment, that might not solve the performance issue because it sounds like that would simply be filtering out the subfolders of inactive or removed users from the UI, but at the same time, they would still be present. Well, the other thing is that it does, Dropbox already has a drop down to view by group. Um, in this case, these were thousands of users just in a site. They didn't really need to be grouped. And if they were grouped, it would have to be done manually. Uh, 
So we're not talking about like a roster situation, at least in the site that, that I'm thinking of. Uh, but I'm not sure that it would be helpful. Now, I guess if you had it as another drop down next to that one to hide the folder, that could be just as helpful as checkbox. But I was thinking a checkbox because that could potentially persist uh, for the instructor on returning to the page. Uh, the problem with the drop down is that it would not persist on reload. I guess my first question about this issue, beyond a question of scalability, because I'm not sure how frequently this is happening in yeah. sites, which is something that we should probably think about, is why we would need a checkbox at all. Because it seems to me that the behavior in most tools and the behavior that most instructors presumably experience and are familiar with is that when students are removed, their stuff is removed. Yep. And so my question is why we wouldn't want Dropbox to simply behave in the same way. Well, that's what I would like for it to do, but other folks protested that it might be better uh, to leave those folders around because instructors might want to access it. And um, and I kind of disagree because I think, you know, if assignments, an instructor uploads feedback to an assignment, they have to re-add the student to access that. You know, it's the same situation. Yeah, and we see a comment here from Laura Sierra in the chat that echoes that to say that, you know, we would like to have consistency. And so uh, we'd like to have, you know, Dropbox acting and behaving in the same way as other tools. Um, and Charles agrees with that as well. And the other um, concern uh, that folks expressed in the chat when I brought this up the first time was that because Dropbox should perform like resources, because it's essentially a, another content mount like resources, that's why it should maintain the content. Um, but the, the difference is that resources maintains content from everybody uh, all the time, whether or not they're in the site. And I think that it's designed more for that purpose for maintaining that content. If you really wanted that to be maintained and available continuously, you could certainly add a folder that allows students to upload and resource. I think I tend to agree with Terry's comment in the chat that if you want student content, keep the student. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. And if you don't need those students in the site any longer, I mean, there are other options for you. You can create a zip, you can mm -hmm. download that content from the tool. Um, but I think I agree with the comments that we're seeing here now that suggests that what we really want to promote, you know, here as everywhere in Sakai is consistent behavior. And mm -hmm. I think consistent behavior is for, for the materials related to the current participants in the site to be displayed. And if you want legacy material from legacy participants, that material should be available when you re-add them to the site. So I will comment in that JIRA that uh, on this call, our consensus was basically that Dropbox should perform like other tools and just remove the folders if those users are not present. I think that sounds good. Anybody have any other thoughts or potential objections to that? Charles notes in the chat that it seems like the behavior is due to the fact that Dropbox file drop is based on resources, so it works in the same way. Adam asks in the chat whether sysadmins should have complete access to all subfolders. Do you mean all subfolders all the time, Adam, for current users and legacy users? Is that what you mean? And Adam indicates that is what he means there. Well, you don't have that true of other tools, though, either. I mean, admins similarly would have to re-add a, a user to a site to see their submissions to other tools. I think I can understand the use case for that, Adam, mm -hmm. as somebody who's an admin. Mm -hmm. But I also think that in terms of consistency, what I would expect, having worked in other tools, is that I would need to re-add the users. And I think I would expect and hope for uniform performance in tools across the board, just speaking as one guy with admin privileges. Okay, I'm going to paste 
link to the next Jira in the chat. The SAC 41297 um, of Samago Jira, and I wish I had noticed that before so I could have skipped it, um, <laughs> allowing minimum points and negative marking to be edited directly on the question screen in testing quizzes. Tiffany, I think you also created this one, so do you want to walk folks through it? Sure. Um, so there's the minimum point value, which is enabled with a property, not by default, um, and negative marking. Uh, which I believe is enabled by default, that you can add to questions, which are additional scoring options. Uh, and when these are enabled, they don't appear on that question screen where when you edit a test, you're on the questions uh, sort of landing screen and you see all the questions and their point values and stuff. Um, and that's a problem if uh, an instructor you know, has students submit a test and then they realize there's a problem with the point value they're like, well, all my students are getting negative one. Why are they doing that? Because they accidentally put a negative point value in there. Um, and when this is a random draw test, it can mean like 100 questions with a negative point value that they have to individually correct. <laughs> but there's no way to see that you've corrected that on the main screen. You actually have to dive into each question's edit screen. And that can be a problem when there are a lot of them because you don't remember which ones you fixed. <laughs> so um, this is a proposal to have those boxes or something visible on the main screen, the main question screen, right where you can edit the points. Uh, you know, to the right of that, minimum points and negative points, uh, like a checkbox to display additional options. Uh, if those are present, checked by default. Uh, if not, you know, unchecked. And then you can type in the numbers there, just like the rest of the point values. So I see some good comments here in the chat. Unfortunately, they're not related to this year specifically as much as they're related to what I should have done to try to prevent this Samago year from coming up in discussion. <laughs> uh, I agree with Laura Sierra that Samago is Thanos and is virtually invincible, unfortunately. Uh, invincible in a terrible way. But Laura Sierra also comments in the chat that this is a worthy JIRA. Um, and I can also see the use cases here and can understand that when we can limit uh, the necessity for instructors to edit published assessments, that's always a nice option. Uh, because when instructors edit published assessments, there's always the danger that bad things can happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Adam comments in the chat uh, that he's going to snap his fingers and see which half of Sakai tools disappear. Adam, when all of society has disappeared and there is nothing left but cockroaches in the wake of <laughs> nuclear war, Samago will still be with us, unfortunately. <laughs> that's right, Samago and cockroaches will be all that's left. Tiffany, have you thought at all about how this might work in the UI? I know you were going to post some. Uh, mock-ups at some point. Have you thought any more about how this might work in the UI? I haven't really. Um, I have thought about redesigning that entire screen so it's less intimidating and easier to use. Um, and I have not incorporated that into that attempted redesign. I did have a Jira for that somewhere. I need to find it. Uh, but, uh, or maybe I did. I don't know. I have to look back. Uh, but what I was thinking is, you know, sort of with each question uh, where you have the points box, some kind of a checkbox for, you know, additional scoring options uh, that you would check and it would display those two additional boxes, uh, assuming they're enabled in the system level, uh, the minimum points and deduct for incorrect answer boxes uh, that you can then type a value into. Now, I don't know how it would work with partial credit multiple choice because partial credit has additional boxes for each option. For that, there might have to be just a notice that you have to edit the question individually to change those. And this, I think, is one of the problems with Samago is that when you start to think about making modifications like this yep. one, you immediately start to run into issues of scope. 
yeah. because you have to figure out, you know, which options belong on which screens and, mm -hmm. you know, which ones are appropriate to display all the time and which ones should be displayed when other options are selected. And I think that makes things much more complicated. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I think this would be a, one of those places where you'd want to have some kind of a trigger to view those additional boxes if you did not have the feature already enabled. So, you know, some kind of a checkbox uh, that if the question by default or if the question when you created it or edited it already had one of those options enabled, the box is checked. Uh, if you didn't have that option enabled on the question screen, you could check it to access and enable the boxes. I think this is the kind of thing where the group seems to agree that we can see a value for the feature, but that the next step would be to see how this would look in the UI uh, before we want to decide how to proceed. Yeah, because we'll need absolutely. to see how this looks in the UI, because obviously this is going to have both a front end and a back end yep. cost associated with it. So Agreed. I think that seems like uh, the next step is for us to kind of think about how that might look on the front end and for us to revisit this um, once we have some mock-ups or some suggestions about how that might work. Sounds good. I'll, I'll try to create some mock-ups uh, sometime soon, and maybe I can bring it back up at another Jira Palooza. I think that sounds good. Anybody okay. have any other comments or objections to that? Thumbs up from Dave. I think that sounds good. So we may have time for just one more JIRA if we move quickly. So I'm going to put the link to that JIRA in the chat. This is SAC 40776, um, a feature request for site info or site settings um, to include uh, the addition of the removal of provided users in the user audit law. So currently, if you've ever seen that or worked with that user audit log uh, in the site info site settings tool, uh, it does not show the addition or removal of users who are being provided, you know, through auto add through a roster or some similar service. It's only going to show annually added and removed participants. Um, and there are certainly use cases where it would be nice to see, you know, when students are being added or removed. Uh, via provision as opposed to the manual addition or removal. Um, anybody have any thoughts or questions or comments about this one? So just to add one comment, um, this also could be um, useful for knowing role updates. So for example, if instructors in a uh, you know, student information system or something are changed to a TA, or vice versa, and their permissions are then automatically changed in the site. It can be very confusing for them. Why, why do I suddenly no longer have permissions? Um, and unfortunately, not necessarily easy for uh, a system administrator to see that the change happened. Uh, you know, they sort of have to ferret out where that change may have happened and when, um, and in some cases, guess. So I think that could be helpful to know uh, when a role update occurs as well from a, uh, an automated service. Let me, add, let me add to that too, because um, one of the ways that I actually address that presently is uh, we get a report um, uh, three times a day roughly um, that lets me know when those ads and removes happen. Um, but that's only something that um, some of the admins have access to. Um, the actual instructors don't have access to that information. So if they're wondering whether or not you know the student added the course late and they don't see them, and that's why, that could surface that information for an instructor as opposed to saying, well, I didn't see you in the course, so I'm sorry, um, or, or, or for whatever reason. So I do see some valid use case for that, especially for those uh, that are uh, using LDAP for this. Absolutely, Dave, I agree. Um, we have some similar access to our SIS data feed here at UVA that allows us to see that stuff on the admin side with a fair degree of granularity so we can see you know, when folks are added, when folks are dropped. But like you all, that information is not currently accessible to instructors at the site level. And so we could bubble some of that up so that they could see that at uh, the site level, it would probably you know, help resolve some of their questions about enrollment changes and things like that before they even get to us. So 
I agree that this would be uh, nice and useful, as both you and Charles have pointed out in the chat. Uh, and Laura reminds us all in the chat that you know if you like a feature, if you like some of the things that we've talked about, uh, vote them up. Uh, go to the JIRAs and, uh, and vote for those JIRAs. If you love it, as Adam does, vote it twice. Vote it, <laughs> unvote, vote again. I don't think that actually does anything, but it makes you feel good. Um, so vote those issues up. And Dave and Charles are noting that they voted on the ones that we've discussed, which is great. So please, you know, vote for these, comment on these, uh, share your thoughts and ideas. That's the way that we move these uh, forward uh, for the attention of the developers within the community. And Laura see your comments in the chat with the state motto of Kentucky, which is where I grew up, vote early, vote often. That's right. Those are my people. And uh, Adam also comments in the chat with a link to the JIRA that he has created about the feedback synoptic tool. So thank you so much for doing that, Adam. And I would really encourage everybody to go and, and vote that up immediately. Watch that JIRA so that we can uh, maybe continue to discuss that at Open Aperio coming up. I think it is the motto of Chicago, Charles, if you're dead. I, I, I think there has to be a reference to the dead voting, since it's usually dead folks that are voting in Chicago. And Dave, I think uh, your suggestion to talk to students about what a feedback area might look like is a great idea. Uh, that's something that I have started to do here with our student group at UVA. And I think the more student feedback we can get about something like that, the better. Um, so I think that's a great idea and something that could really um, add some additional punch uh, to a potential feedback tool. All right, it's 10.58 and we are almost at time. So I want to take just one minute um, to talk about our upcoming schedule. Um, so two weeks from today, uh, on Wednesday, May 15th, uh, Miguel Pellicer uh, is going to be talking talking to us about a number of proof of concepts that he's been working on, um, including video submission improvements and uh, proof of concept for an Office 365 integration. Um, so I know uh, schools that are Microsoft schools, schools that are considering adding additional Microsoft functionality will be interested in that. Um, UDA is adding more uh, Microsoft integrations all the time, so we are definitely interested uh, in seeing that. So you won't want to miss that. Uh, Miguel is a great presenter, always has really good ideas and always has really exciting uh, demos and proof of concepts to show. So I encourage all of you guys to be here uh, with us two weeks from today on May 15th so that you can check that out. And then don't forget um, that the following regular meeting time, uh, Wednesday, June the 5th, uh, we'll not have a meeting uh, due to Open Aperio. Uh, many of us will be uh, in LA for Open Aperio at that time. Um, so we will not have a meeting uh, on Wednesday, June the 5th. Uh, we will resume our regular meetings, um, barring no cancellations, on uh, Wednesday, June the 19th. Oh, and oh I see a question about Sakai Camp. Um, we. We haven't set the dates for that yet. Um, that might be something we talk about at the community meeting at Open Imperio. Um, but uh, it's usually end of January. That that's typically been the the time that we've settled on. So I would, you know, kind of tentatively plan for the last couple of weeks in January, somewhere in there. And also a comment from Dave about uh, the progress tool uh, that showed up in some email traffic uh, on the Sakai list. If you haven't seen uh, that email traffic, go and check that out because that seems like a discussion that you may want to uh, explore more uh, and dive into later this summer. And Dave is also asking about a UX meeting today at 11. I don't think I have seen a reminder for that meeting, Dave, so I'm not sure if we're having one or not. I, I believe it is. It's in room three right after this call. I don't see Sean um, or Jolie on this call, so they're, they're usually the ones that remind folks. But um, as far as I know, it's still on the calendar. So. And Charles also indicates that as far as he knows, it's scheduled. So it sounds like folks should head over to room three um, right now and check out our UX feed. And we may also uh, want to add SAC 41366 um, at the beginning of our 
next meeting on the 15th, um, time provided. I think that's a great suggestion, Adam, and I will go ahead and put that on the list. All right, we are one minute over, and I think uh, we used our time very well, and we got a chance to discuss a lot of really interesting issues and uh, get some good discussion and some good feedback. So thank you all so much for taking the time to join us and talk through all these issues. Uh, have a great week, everybody, and we will see you right back here in two weeks on Wednesday, May the 15th for Miguel's presentation. Thanks again, everybody. See you next time.